Welcome everyone to Fair Territory. The Super Bowl is behind us. Baseball is starting to get into full swing. Two teams already have reported the spring training, the Dodgers and Padres. They're going to play in Korea early. And the rest of the teams report this week. Pitchers and catchers, and you'll have the position players following next week. We've got plenty to discuss today. And I know some of you might be looking at this and saying, whoa, Ken, a little bit better backdrop than in recent weeks. Yes, it is. I've changed locations. I have moved to parts unknown. No, I'm not going to reveal my locale. AJ Przinsky will be asking me that on foul territory, and he's not getting an answer either. You guys get a lot of me. You don't need to know everything. But anyway, without further ado, let's get to our spring storylines. Top five spring storylines, some fun things to discuss here. We're going to go in reverse order. Now, this is my opinion of the top five storylines. If you are a fan of a certain team, these are probably not your top five storylines. From a national perspective, here is what I am looking at. Okay, here we go. Number five on the storylines of the spring, extensions. We've already had a few, of course, Bobby Witt Jr. being the big one last week. And there are a number of players who I'm sure will at least be in conversations about extensions this spring. Zach Wheeler of the Phillies may be the most likely of them all. He's a potential free agent. Pete Alonso of the Mets, also a potential free agent, represented by Scott Boris, who generally likes to go to the open market. It'll be talked about. I don't expect it to happen. Paul Goldschmidt of the Cardinals. Now, their GM, John Moselock, has already said that they probably will not start conversations until after the season begins. We shall see. And then there are younger players. Kyle Tucker, not a young player exactly, but he is two years away from free agency. Adley Rushman, on the other hand, he's a guy maybe the Orioles will entertain now that they'll be under new ownership. He is not a free agent until after the 2027 season. And I am sure, quite sure, that a number of other players will be discussed as well. Contract extensions are always discussed at this time of year for younger players. So we're going to see, I'm sure, quite a few. Number four on the list, wow, new managers. Now we start with Craig Council, the Cubs' new manager, but he is only one of eight new managers. Let's take a look at the list right now. It's kind of stunning how many teams have changed managers for the 2024 season. You see it right there, Council with the Cubs, Stephen Vogt with the Guardians, Joe Espada with the Astros, Ron Washington with the Angels, Pat Murphy replacing Council with the Brewers, Carlos Mendoza with the Mets replacing Buck Showalter, big shoes to fill, Mike Schilt and Bob Melvin. Well, Schilt goes to the Padres, Melvin to the Giants. Obviously, when you have a new manager take over, different things happen with teams, different Cultures are established, different rules in certain cases. All of these managers will be closely scrutinized this spring to see the tone that they're setting. Spring training means nothing. We all know that. But you can set a set of standards. And that is what is going to happen with these managers this spring. And the Cubs, of course, will be under greater scrutiny than some of these clubs. One, because council is there. And two, because we're still waiting for them to sign a big free agent. Which brings us to storyline number three. That would be the Boris Four. Now, you could call them the Boris Six because there actually are six big free agents remaining who are represented by Scott Boris. Who are they? You've heard their names for weeks now. Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, Matt Chapman, Cody Bellinger, and the two others, J.D. Martinez and Hyun Jin Ryu. Now, we're going to find out in the coming weeks just how these guys fare in free agency. But as I wrote last week in the windup, that's the Athletics free baseball newsletter, the projections that Tim Britton of The Athletic had at the start of the offseason were seemingly, I thought, realistic. And they still are realistic. Maybe some of those Boris clients will get to these numbers. Maybe some of them will surpass them. Maybe some of them won't reach them at all. Let's take a look at what Tim projected for the big four, the Boris four, at the start of the offseason. Bellinger? Six years, $162 million. Probably wants more. We'll see if he gets it. Blake Snell, two-time Cy Young winner. Five years, $135 million. Definitely wants more. We'll see if he gets it. Jordan Montgomery, five years, one hundred five. million. Matt Chapman, five years, $95 million. Again, we'll see how this all plays out. That is the Boris Four. All right, moving on now. We'll be talking about a team with another prominent 
Scott Boris client, one who will be a free agent after this season. And I guess I could have included this guy among the possible extension candidates, but I don't expect him to sign an extension. He turned down $440 million from the Washington Nationals a couple of years ago. Now he is on the verge of a $500 million deal. I'm talking, of course, about Juan Soto. Now, he is a spring training storyline, but really, the Yankees are a greater spring training storyline. Their health, in particular, is Rodon going to come back healthy? Carlos Rodon. Is Nestor Cortez Jr. going to come back healthy? And how is this all going to play out for the Yankees? If one of those pitchers gets hurt, maybe they get more active with regard to a Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery, something along those lines. And finally, our number one storyline. Now, I know a lot of fans are not going to like this one because a lot of fans don't like that this team spent a billion dollars this offseason. But the Dodgers are the story in the sport right now, the biggest story in the sport. Otani, Yamamoto, all of the things that they've done. Tyler Glass now coming in, Teoscar Hernandez, on and on. We've seen already from their spring training site photos of the media presence, which is quite significant especially in this day and age when you don't have as much media traveling. But at the same time, it's warranted. It's warranted because this team has spent more than a billion dollars. This team will be under scrutiny all season. This team will be under a unique form of pressure all season. The manager, Dave Roberts, is going to be under even greater pressure than ever before. Every game for them, as Mookie Betts said, will be like a World Series game, at least for the opponent. So we'll see how it all plays out with the Dodgers. We'll see how it all plays out with their media and how this just all unfolds over the course of the 2024 season. It's the biggest story of the season. It's going to remain that way, however it turns out. All right, one news item from the weekend that I want to get to as well, and that was something reported last night by Robert Murray of Fansided. Yasmani Grandal going to the Pirates for two and a half million. Now, Yasmani Grandal is not what he once was. In fact, he's coming off a bad year, bad couple of years, honestly. But the Pirates have now signed six free agents. And people might say, whoa, six free agents, that's pretty good. The Pirates are kind of coming alive here. Well, they're trying to, but let's look at the spending in the NL Central. Because the Pirates still lag behind, even with all of the free agents they've signed. You see the Reds there at 109 million, Cardinals 105, Cubs 62 million, and they still have one big move left. The Brewers 59.25 million, and the Pirates 29.6 million. Aroldis Chapman, the biggest of those signings, at 10.5. Yeah, the Pirates have brought in some veterans, Chapman and Martin Perez and others. They are a team that could be a lot better this year. O'Neill Cruz is coming back. We're all looking forward to seeing that. But when it comes to spending, the Pirates still are lagging behind in the NL Central. Time now for the Inside Dish. We're going to do something a little bit different this week. I usually talk about a story I've written, a trend in the game, something I want to go deeper on. But this week, I'm going to talk about what it's like to cover spring training. Spring training, as you guys know, takes place in two different states, Florida and Arizona. And the experiences are quite different in each. In Arizona, everything is centrally located. There used to be two teams in Tucson, which is about 90 miles south of Phoenix, but now all of the teams are in the Phoenix area. And the greatest distance that a baseball writer or actually a team has to travel between two camps, the greatest distance is 47 miles. That's from Surprise, where the Rangers and Royals train, to Mesa, where the Cubs train. 47 miles, that's it. Most of the camps are within a half hour of each other. So generally speaking, each year, what I'll do is set up in one location and just spread out each day and go to a different camp each day. And as a writer, I have more flexibility than I do in Florida, which I'll get to in a minute. The reason is if something's happening, say with the Angels, and I want to jump over there on a given day, I can do that. Same with the Reds or the Royals or any team in Arizona. Dodgers are here. Giants are here. There are a number of teams here, 15, just like in Florida. Florida is much different. In Florida, you can't simply set up in one place. The camps are spread too far and wide. So generally what I do is I will start in usually Tampa when I go. And I'll go generally two weeks in each. 
Start in Tampa, hit that area. The Phillies are there, the Yankees are there, the Blue Jays, the Orioles and Pirates are not far. The Tigers are in that area as well. Then I'll drift south to Fort Myers. That's where the Red Sox twins are. The Rays are not too far away. The Braves as well. And then over to the eastern side of the state, Jupiter is where I will usually be. The Mets are up in Port St. Lucie. The Cardinals and Marlins are in Jupiter. And the Astros and Nationals are really close by in West Palm Beach. It's three different sites, so to speak. And you can't simply wake up one day and say, you know what, I want to go to the Yankees today because you might be on the other side of the state three and a half hours away. So that's how Florida works. And I've got one story to tell about Florida and being there and just how crazy it can get when the distances come into play. Now, a few years ago, this was 2019, after Evan Drellick and I wrote the Astros sign stealing story, you might remember that Cody Bellinger over in Arizona, when he was still with the Dodgers, ripped the Astros and said some things about Altuve, how he shouldn't be the MVP. And it was a big controversy. That spring training in general was all about the Astros. The penalties had come out in January, just a month before. There was a lot of talk. So I was in Florida. I was on the east side of the state in Jupiter, Florida. And Carlos Correa, who I know well, I've covered him for a long time, texts me and he says, I want to respond to Cody Bellinger. I'm like, okay. I was thinking he wanted to do something for print. And I was good with that, of course. I wanted to hear what he had to say. But when Carlos and I continued texting and tried to arrange a time to meet, he made it clear to me that he wanted this to be on television. And at the time I was working for MLB Network, so that would be possible. There was only one problem. The MLB Network crew had asked me the day before, hey, are we good to go now over to Tampa? And I said, sure, why not? There's nothing really happening here of great consequence. Those guys were having steak at a steakhouse in Tampa, enjoying themselves when I called and said, uh, Carlos Correa wants to talk tomorrow morning. Can you get back? They had to scramble back. We did the interview. It's Maybe the most memorable interview I've done in my entire career. Correa was on fire. And whether you agree or disagree, I'm just talking about the quality of the interview. Just the passion that he showed for what he was saying. He, of course, said some things. I challenged him on some things. It went back and forth. But the real story was, at least from my personal perspective, was those poor guys. The audio guy, the producer, and I guess the cameraman. They all had to drag back and leave their dinner, drive all night, and that's how it went down. My other favorite story from spring training, this one is not as spicy as that one, but it involved one year when I was in the Angels Clubhouse. Now, spring training is a much more relaxed atmosphere. No one has lost a game yet. The players are cool. They're not worried really much about anything. They're just getting ready for the season. The managers are more relaxed than they would be during the season. It's just in general an easier atmosphere to interview, an easier atmosphere overall. So I'm in the Angels Clubhouse one morning. It's about 8, 8.30. And I'm talking, I believe it was to Jared Weaver. And we're sitting there talking. And all of a sudden, I hear the room go silent. Now, Mike Sosha, when he was manager of the Angels, had a meeting every morning with his players. Usually, he would say something funny or they'd do a skit or just something to lighten the mood. Sometimes it was more serious than that, of course. Well, the room had gone quiet because Mike Sosha was about to start his meeting. So I'm talking to Jared Weaver. I've got my back to where Sosha is. And I turn around and there's Mike Sosha. And he's like, uh, Ken, would it be okay with you if we start our meeting now? And I ran out of there very quickly. Spring training is a blast. I love covering it. Love it a little bit more in Arizona than Florida because it's a little easier. But overall, it's my favorite time of year. Time now for Dude and Dork of the Week. We've got a little bit of a twist on it this week, but I'll get to that in a second. First, the Dude of the Week. A pitcher who announced his retirement last week. A pitcher who, for a five-year period, from 2014 to 18, was among the most dominant pitchers in the game and among the most dominant pitchers of our recent times. I'm talking, of course, about Corey Kluber. In that five-year period, 2014 to 18, he won two Cy Youngs, finished third twice, finished ninth once. 
in that five-year period, he put up numbers that, though we're only a few years down the line, seem almost impossible now that we judge differently in today's game. In that five-year period, Corey Kluber averaged 32 starts, 218 innings, averaged, and 246 strikeouts. He was a machine. He was the Klubot. He was a great, great pitcher and someone who carried himself in a really classy, dignified way. Didn't show any emotion, of course, but he was really cool on the mound. He went on, of course, and had some injuries. Wasn't really the same. Did have the no-hitter for the Yankees in 2021, but just for a fantastic career, Corey Kluber, Dude of the Week. Dorks of the Week, now we generally reserve that title for someone or some group of people that have done something stupid. But I want to twist it a little bit this week to name the dupes of the week. The dupes of the week would be the Nevada State Legislature and the governor of Nevada, Joe Lombardo. Why have they been duped? Well, they've committed $380 million in public funding to a team that cannot get its act together. I'm talking, obviously, about the Oakland A's. Now, I could have named John Fisher Dork of the Week again. He's like a nine-time winner at this point. But really, let's look at Nevada here. They committed to the A's. The A's don't know where they're playing from 2025 to 27. They committed to the A's. The A's don't know logistically how a new ballpark with a roof is going to fit into a nine-acre site. And the A's don't even know if this ballpark will be done by 2028 because guess what? The state teachers union in Nevada is suing to block that public funding. They want that not to happen. So we've got a lot of things going on here, but yet Joe Lombardo, the governor, and the state legislature couldn't wait to embrace Major League Baseball. Well, maybe they should have lobbied harder for an expansion team instead. All right, time now for Grilling Ken. Let's get to your questions and see what we've got this week. First comes from Chance Henry, who asks, how likely are the Red Sox to trade Kenley Jansen? Why would that matter at all in a possible Montgomery signing? Chance, you ask a good question. It shouldn't matter at all. There has been a lot of talk about a possible Jansen trade. I don't see it happening necessarily at this point. Now, granted, for a team that is cutting payroll, a team that doesn't seem to be putting forth its full effort, a $16 million closer is a luxury, especially one at an advanced age. But who is going to take Kenley Jansen at this point? Now, he's still good. Don't get me wrong. But how is this all going to happen? The Dodgers, to me, seem to make the most sense, and the Dodgers right now seem to be pretty full with their roster and what they're doing. Now, the Red Sox could always include cash in a deal to bring the salary down, to get a better prospect in return, and maybe that's ultimately what will happen. Should it affect a pursuit of Jordan Montgomery or any other player for that matter? No. The Red Sox, they've announced, essentially, that they might be at a lower payroll number this year. I don't know why. Right now, their payroll's at 178. Last year, it was 199. They're already down. Now, if you take it down further, that gives you greater room, yes, to sign a Jordan Montgomery. But guess what? The Boston Red Sox should be able to sign Jordan Montgomery and keep Kenley Jansen, too. All right, the next question comes from Mitch. Mitch asks, the D-backs reportedly are in on a right-handed bat to compliment Peterson at DH. Fam, Duval, Grichik, or no more moves left for them. I'd be a little surprised if they did this, but if the price drops enough on any of those players, and I don't necessarily expect that it will, sure, they might look for one more bat. If you remember, they've already added Lourdes Gurriel Jr., free agent that was returning to the team, and Eugenio Suarez at third base. That's two right-handed hitters. They've got Peterson now. Peterson, of course, hits righties much better than lefties, though he hasn't gotten much of a chance against lefties in recent years. The Diamondbacks' payroll right now is at a record level, $142 million, record for their franchise. Can they go a little bit higher, four, five, six million? I guess, but that's a question for their owner, Ken Kendrick. Finally, the last question comes from Syracuse Jurgen Klopp44, who asks, between Soler and Bellinger, which do you think could help a contender more to win the World Series? Reasonable question, considering that they're both still free agents, but Bellinger is the much better defender and all-around player, so he could help a team more to win the World Series. Soler, in 
theory, could be the better hitter, right? He could slug 40 home runs, and Bellinger might not do that. But Bellinger is going to be able to play first, center field. So there, you can stick him in the outfield, but you don't really want to put him out there too often. All right, I want to thank everyone for watching, everyone for listening, and I want to give a special thank you to the people who have been commenting on the YouTube page. The comments there are much more civil than anything you see on X, even more civil than the comments I usually get on The Athletic for my articles. Now, obviously, sometimes I invite things on myself with things that people might not like on The Athletic, but at the same time, I do appreciate everyone on YouTube just being so cool and civil with what they're saying in response to the show. And never mind people disagreeing with what I say. That's all part of it. That's why we love baseball, the arguments. But I do appreciate when people are respectful. And from what I've seen, people have been really respectful. So you know where to find us. YouTube, Spotify, Apple. Like us, subscribe to us. Stay with us. We'll be back next Monday.